through a study of the book of Acts, at least, uh, for maybe not don't go through all of it, but at least the first seven chapters or so. Just before Jesus uh, ascended into heaven, he so told the disciples to wait for the Holy Spirit would come and that he would uh, empower them, the Holy Spirit would empower them to be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and the uttermost parts. The first seven chapters deals with the area of Jerusalem and the impact of making disciples. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. Peter, who had denied the Lord several times and uh, was in so many ways timid in his faith and would make excuses at his time and kind of wanted to be a one-upmanship over some of the others. Uh, uh, basically, a, a guy who puts his foot in his mouth, God ends up using that particular guy to preach the message on Pentecost Sunday. 3,000 people came to Christ. The church was birthed out of one message, and now it covers the entire earth in every continent. During the time in which he spoke, uh, uh, not only was there the uh, people coming to Christ, but in Acts chapter 3, a guy who was a beggar, lame from birth, put outside the temple courts, he was healed as Peter and John walked by. Uh, the church uh, then began to, to, uh, to uh, meet together uh, constantly. Uh, they broke bread together. They were involved in the apostles' teaching, trying to learn and to grow together. Uh, they uh, had fellowship together. They prayed together. They did this every day. As the church began to grow and they started preaching the word, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious people of the day, uh, they ended up seizing Peter and John. They put them in jail. They interrogated them. Um, told them not to speak or anything about Jesus anymore. And they said, well, we, we have to keep on doing that. Nothing's going to stop us. They didn't hold anything back. As a result, they were threatened once again. Uh, but because of the miracle of the healing of that uh, beggar who uh, could not, wasn't able to walk, he was now able to leap and jump. And he was praising the Lord. He goes into the temple and prays and and, uh, and so now, all of a sudden, the, the church is now growing once again. There's a great sense of anticipation as to what is going to happen in, in all of their lives. They've seen the miraculous. They've heard the miraculous. People's lives are changed. People are meeting day after day together. And um, as that ends up happening, uh, I want to read. There are portions here uh, in your notes. It's broken down into three different sections I'm going to read a little bit first from chapter 4, uh, and, then, and then the first 11 verses. We'll talk a little bit about that and then go to the next session. Uh, beginning in chapter 4, verse 32, all the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any possession was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them. There was no needy person among them. From time to time, those who owned lands or houses, uh, they sold them and they brought the money uh, of the, from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as a person had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Bartimus, which means son of encouragement, sold a field. He owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, chapter 5, together with his wife Sapphira, who also sold a piece of property, with his wife's full knowledge, he kept that part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received from the Lord? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young men came, wrapped up his body, carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land 
Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door. They will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. You can be an honest person but not have integrity. But if you have integrity, you will be an honest person. Let me explain. A man and a woman bought uh, a chicken fried dinner for their picnic and uh, in the afternoon and the attendant at the fast food uh, outlet, uh, however inadvertently when he was getting ready to pick up the uh, bucket of food, he picked up the wrong bucket. And um, when he gave it to the couple, they left and they went and drove to their picnic site. And as they began to open up and sat down to enjoy the picnic, they discovered that there was a whole lot more than chicken in there. Matter of fact, there wasn't any chicken in there at all. It was all of the money that was to be put in their bank account and for that it was $800. And so they took the $800, they counted it out and saw it. That was really, they put all the money back into the bucket and they drove back to, they drove back to, um, the uh, place they bought the chicken. And so they went in, and by this time, of course, the manager was extremely frantic, worried about this, and they, he came in, and the guy asked, a uh, couple came in, they asked for the, the manager, and the manager came over, and they said, listen, we just got some chicken here, but they gave us the wrong bucket, and here in there was a whole bunch of money. And the manager was absolutely thrilled to death. He said, I, let, stay here a moment. I want to call the newspaper, and I'm going to have them take a picture of you. I want them to take and put your picture in the paper. You're the most honest man I've ever heard. Thank you for being so honest. And the uh, man quickly responded. He leans over, and he says, no, 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 don't, don't do that. So he whispers to him. He, he says, you see, uh, the woman that I'm with, she's somebody else's husband. Now, one can be honest, but still not have integrity. With Ananias and Sapphira, they had decided that what they were going to do was they were going to give not all of the money for the piece of property that they sold. They could have been honest and said, we're giving this portion. They could have easily done that. They weren't compelled or had to do that. It was up to their op, op. But because they wanted to look better than what they really were, they implied, and this is the price that we got for it, and they basically lied. Now, through this, in, in these verses, there's some, uh, or some observations I want you to see, and you can fill in your notes on this when you look at it. In verse uh, 3, uh, it says, then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and you have kept for yourself some of the money that you received? How did Peter know that? You know, it's interesting, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there is a list of nine spiritual gifts that were given to the church, healings, miracles, um, uh, a word of knowledge, uh, discerning of spirits, speaking in tongues, uh, interpretation, prophecy, etc. And here what you see is the operation, since the Holy Spirit was just given to them, here is the operation of the gift of knowledge. The gift of knowledge operated in Peter in verse 3. The gift of knowledge was God gave to Peter information there's no way he would have known by himself. God spoke to him and he knew that this was not so true. The second thing that we see that's in your notes is that the Holy Spirit here, he is called a person in verse three. And later on he says, you have not, he said, you have uh, not lied, you can't lie to uh, an inanimate object, you can only lie to a person. But he said, he said uh, also that, uh, that 
uh, you have lied to, uh, you have not lied to men, but you have lied to God. So he calls the Holy Spirit not only a person, but also God. In verse 4, it says that the property was their own, and that's very, very key. Once again, they did not have to give all of, any of the money at all. They could have just given half or a price or whatever they wanted to. They were not compelled. The money was their own. It was not a, a socialistic or a communist type of society. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, Peter, when he... Uh, he never said anything about uh, Ananias, that he was going to die. Just an observation. Just all of a sudden he falls down and he dies. We also see that as a result of that, judgment brought a great deal of reverence for God. The other people were in awe of this. They recognized that we should have reverence, a reference, uh, reverence for God. Again, in verse 9, when uh, 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 Sapphira ends up coming in, He's, he says to her um, about the, the piece of property, tell me, is this the price that you and Ananias got for the land? See, he knew, why, why is he asking? Because he knew that it wasn't. The operation of the gift of knowledge was once again, twice in this chapter, the gift of knowledge was given to him. I remember, you know, those, and there's probably a number of times in your life in which the gift of knowledge act absolutely operates, and sometimes we aren't so much aware of it, and other times we are profoundly aware of it. I remember when I was in Santa Barbara, I was a youth pastor, and it was an evening service, and I was, uh, after the service, some uh, woman uh, came up to me and was talking to me about uh, uh, an issue that was in her life, and we were sitting down, we were talking, Carter was back two or three rows, and uh, my wife started praying for her, and what was interesting afterwards, when we got together, Carla told me what her problem was. And she had never met the person, but Carla was praying for the person because God gave to her a word of knowledge on how to pray specifically for the person I was talking to. And that happens at times in our lives in which just somehow the Spirit of God, just that's one of the gifts of, of, of the Holy Spirit gives to us. Now, in the next portion of Scripture, I'm going to read that as, as well. Uh, verse 12, the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the people used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared uh, join them, uh, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more women believed, men and women believed that the Lord in the Lord, and they were added to the number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and mats so at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from, uh, from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. Some interesting things here as we see how God, uh, the leadership, uh, the apostles, in this particular case, we see it later on with the uh, with deacons as well, and actually later on throughout the scriptures with people who were following God. But what ends up happening, there is a wholesome and godly respect for leadership. Now, I know this. There is no leader on the face of this earth who is perfect. But respect for leadership is an attitude of the heart of anyone following a leader. And I believe... And of course, I'm not always going to be here, so that's kind of nice. But I can say this to you. That is always, a person should never, ever pray for a leader to fail or to be removed. A person should always pray for anybody in leadership that God would shore them up and make them strong and make them to be a vessel because God wants the very best. The fact is, there isn't anybody in this room who's perfect. So if you don't like following me, then I can say, I don't like following you. You know, I mean, the fact is, is that we are all in this together. One of these days, we're all going to be in heaven together, hopefully. And when we are, we're going to have to learn to get together. Why don't we start now? Amen. Yeah. Why don't we start now? Amen. Yeah, that was good. There was a wholesome respect for leadership. Secondly, we see that there was godly fear 
that seized the church, which as a result of that, it drew some people to become believers and followers because of people's fear, not, not of being afraid, but a sense of holy reverence for God. People became, became believers because of other people's hunger and desire for God. Number three in your notes. I want you to notice that the sentence does not say that the shadow of Peter healed any one of them or that it did not. Now, I would imagine that some of you have heard that some, from some speakers down the line that they put them in Peter's shadow so that they would be healed. It does not say that they were healed because of that or, it didn't, or, or that it did or didn't. What is rather interesting is the phrase, the shadow of Peter, is purely an Eastern phrase. And in Eastern lands, even today, people will try to escape the shadow of a man because he has an evil influence over people. And if that person walks by who has an evil influence and that shadow, there is a belief system, kind of like uh, walking under a ladder or a cat running across. It's a, it's, it's, it's a superstitious type of thing that if I'm in the shadow of an evil person, that that evilness will come upon me. There's an influence on it. So you would stay away from that. But if a shadow of a, a prominent person who has a godly or a good influence, then you want to get into their shadow because that was their belief system. Now, we don't, what, what's interesting is not everybody was in the shadow, but everyone who was there was healed. What we do know out of this passage, which is rather interesting, is that the people recognized that God was with Peter and the apostles. And because of that, they wanted to be around them. I've said this to you before. One of the best things you can do to have your life be strong in God is to hang around people who love God a lot. That influence will influence you. They, that person can't make you change, but being around someone who's godly and has a heart for God, the more you're around them, it'll captivate your heart to where you are wanting more to be like what they have themselves. Acts chapter 5, verse 17 through 42. By the time we finish this so far, we have read the entire first four chapters. You have heard the first four chapters of this book all being read, and now by the end of today, you're going to hear the end of the fifth chapter. And like I said a couple of weeks ago, out of all the things I've said, the most important thing that I have said this morning is when I have not said anything other than I read the Word of God. Because the Word of God, faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing what? Hearing the word of God. Verse 17. Then the high priest and all the associates who were members of the, of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the, the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of the new life, this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, the apostles, and as they had been told, they began to preach to the people. When the high priest and the associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving to the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and they reported, we found the jail securely locked and the guards standing at the door. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the guard and the chief priest were puzzled, wondering what would come of this. Then someone came in and said, look, the men you put in the jail are standing in the temple courts, teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. 
This, they did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter, here he goes, and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed. He's talking to these officials. Whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things. And so it is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. So the apostles are put outside the room. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do with these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared, claiming to be somebody, and then about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all of his followers were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the sentence and led a band of people in a revolt. He too was killed, and all of his followers were scattered. Therefore, in, in, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go, for their purpose or activity is of human origin. Ha, ha is of human origin, it will fail. But it is from, but if it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them, and they called the apostles in and had them flogged, and then ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Some interesting things in regards to uh, some observations here. Because the apostles, number one on this, because the apostles were successful, the religious leaders were jealous of the apostles' success. An interesting thing is, is after they were successful, they had just done all the miracles, and as a result of the miracles and the healings, their doing good put the apostles in jail. Just because you do good as a follower of Jesus, sometimes the results may not turn out so good. You'd like to say, if I do everything right, my life will be easy because God is with me. Not so. Life is not always easy. The rain falls on the just and on the unjust. We will go through persecution and trials in this land. If I follow Jesus, not everything's going to turn out right. But in the end, it will. It always does for the believer. But sometimes you're doing good can cause you to be put in jail. And that's what happened to them. Number three, an angel gets them out of jail and he tells them to go back to the temple courts and continue the message. I wonder what the apostles thought when the angel came and let them out. And then he says, all right, go back into the temple courts and do this. They could have said, been there, done that, didn't work. But they did, at daybreak, they went out and they started doing it again. When things didn't go their way, the apostles didn't sit on the sidelines. They went out and did what they were told to do, and that was, and they were told to do, what they were told to do did not make sense for them. Because what they were doing, going out and preaching in the courts, for that they were put into jail. The angel says, go out and do it again. It didn't make sense to do it again because the end result would be they'd be put back into jail, which they were. The apostles uh, uh, are put back into prison. They're told not to preach. 
um, Jesus uh, before, and um, now they're told him again, the apostles end up preaching to the Sanhedrin. And they say, we must obey God rather than you. Well, the Sanhedrin obviously is very furious about this. Well-respected leaders uh, in Gamal gave good advice and persuaded the Sanhedrin to let them go. As a result, the apostles were flogged and threatened and then released. And then what ends up happening is after the apostles are threatened and they are beaten, what do they do? They get out and they complain about their beatings. No, that's not what they did. After they were flogged and beaten and they were released, they were rejoiced that they suffered for Jesus. What? A, that is so against our grain, isn't it? You see, our ways are not his ways. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, you've got to be the least. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. It's holy contradictions, isn't it? If you want to be great, humble yourself. <laughs> The apostles rejoice. And then not only that, the apostles continued to do the same things that put them in jail and had them flogged. Verse 30, 42, it says, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Now, last Sunday, we're driving home, because I'm not done with my message yet. We're on our way home last Sunday. And as we're talking in the car, uh, Carter makes some comments about David. I didn't really see your passion in your message. Now, I'm, you know, what do you do when your wife tells you something like that? Very simple. You put your hand over her mouth because <laughs> you don't want to hear it again. But one of the things that I have learned is... Nobody can walk the Christian life alone. It's always nice to have someone who's honest, who wants the best for you. She could have said, go preach on something else. Your heart's not in it. Quit the job. No. She's saying, I didn't hear your heart. I want to hear your heart. So, I had already worked on my message, already some the previous week, for this coming week, and then Wednesday I was sitting in my office and I had been mulling over this, David, where is your passion? Where's the application to what I said last week? Yet it was interesting because someone came up and they said it was a wonderful message. You know, I think I'd rather listen to that person rather than my wife, you know, it's just. <laughs> but, but, but so what happened was I was sitting in my office and I thought, God, this is an interesting story, but what, how can we bring it to where we are right now, and how does it apply to us? And so I, I did something that I do maybe about once every five years, if that. I got online, and I looked up something called Sermon Central, and they have a whole bunch of people give messages, and they have outlines, and so I put in there Acts chapter 5, and then I saw a whole bunch of a whole bunch of topics of titles for that chapter. None of them applied but one, and it was the title that got to me. I read the first paragraph and then forgot the thing and then developed what I'm going to share with you now. You know, it's interesting that sometimes you can pick up something from somebody else that can captivate your heart and get your own uh, heart being excited about something. And this was the thought. It said there are... um, Do the last slide here. Yeah, the application. Two different um, approaches. We see the apostles, they were people who gave all they had. They didn't hold anything back. They didn't hold anything back. They were beaten. First off, they they were interrogated. They were told, don't say anything. They were put in the jail. They were told that again and again, and then they're beaten and they're flogged, and every time, you know, the same thing, they kept out and they kept doing the same thing. They went out, even if they got beaten and flogged. They they did not hold anything back in their walk with God. 
Now, as a result, um, we find at the very end, uh, after, they're out of, after they've been flogged, they go out and they start doing it again. Pretty soon, matter of fact, in chapter 8, verse 1, all of the believers, they're all scattered because they're all being persecuted. But what's happening with their persecution and with them being scattered, they now go to Jerusalem and Judea, and then eventually to the uttermost parts, which eventually leads to here to America, and you and I became Christians simply because they didn't hold anything back. Ananias and Sapphira, on the other hand, they held back something. Well, I started thinking about that whole issue, about holding something back. What are things that hold people back from giving all out to God? I remember when I was uh, probably about 24 or 5, and I was, uh, I was, I, I, I love God. I had given myself to, to been involved in ministry and helping in a church as a layperson. And but I, one thing I didn't want to do, was I didn't want to give all out to God because I had a misconception about God that affected my giving all out to Him. I was brought up Lutheran, and I don't remember a lot of different messages during that time in which I was there, but I remember we didn't have missionaries come very often, but the missionaries that we did have when they came to our church, to me, maybe not to others, but to me and where I was in my life at the time, they were the most boring people I'd ever listened to. And I thought this was my misconception, but I was afraid to give all out to God because I thought if I gave all out to God, he's going to make me be a missionary, therefore I'm going to be an extremely boring person. Now, now I, I'll tell you, I mean, it was very deep-seated in me. You may laugh at it, but I was afraid to give all out to God because I was sure he would make me become a missionary. And I didn't want, it wasn't, I didn't care about being a missionary. I just didn't want to be a boring person. And so I, I was hesitant to do that. Well, I got some theology straight by talking to an individual, asking him some questions that helped me walk through that time in my life. And I realized that it doesn't make any difference. The issue is, do I love him? Am I going to give all out and hold nothing back regardless of what I think about it, even if my conception is wrong about it? And I decide I'm going to give out to God. I ended up going back to Northwest. And when I, my major was, um, my minor, I, I, I majored, uh, I don't even remember what my major was, it was in Bible or whatever, but my, my minor was in missions. I got a minor in missions because I wanted to prove to God I meant business. He already knew I meant business. I got my minor in missions because I needed to prove to myself I was willing to give all out for God. I wasn't going to hold anything back. And maybe there are some things in your life that may cause you to hold back something of giving all out. Sometimes we compartmentalize our life. This is my social life. This is my financial life. These, this is my Christian life. These are my friends. And we can put all these things in different lives, and sometimes it's very easy to hold back in a given area. Quite often, I see people holding back in their giving of service to God by involving themselves in ministry in the church because they for one reason or another. Sometimes people hold back because they want to keep all of their own things themselves in terms of finances. But one's concept of God can hold one from giving all out to him. People sometimes hold back in terms of relationships. If you've ever been in a place where you have had a really close relationship with someone and as a result, you got burned. They treated you wrong. You went through a horrible, difficult time. And you were hurt so deeply that 
you end up becoming, and I've seen this happen numerous times, and I'm sure you have too, you get burned and hurt so bad that you're afraid to really get close to other people. You hold back, you build walls, because you don't want to be burned and hurt again. It hurts too deeply. And so you hold back in building relationships with people. Some people have been involved in ministry and doing something and as a result gotten burned and because of that they, they don't want to do that again. Some people have been in a church and been burned by people in the church, leaders in the church, pastors, other people in the church, lay friends in the church. They get burned by them and as a result they build up walls. They don't want to build relationship and as a result of that their life is hurting inside because they put on masks, they build walls they don't engage because I don't want to be burned. I want to be hurt again. And probably maybe, I wouldn't doubt it, but there's probably a few of you, there may be an area in your life in which that's the case. Some people hold back and don't give all in because of fear of the uncertainty of what might take place, just the fear of the unknown. And there are some times in which what the apostles did, it's they were told to go back out. And this is what happened sometimes. What happened with the apostles, they were told, or they went out, they preached in the courts, they're put in the jail, they're told not to do that, they're released by the angel, they go out, they're told to do the same thing, and they do it, they don't hold back. But what is it doing? Doing the same thing, puts them right back into jail again, and this time they get flogged. It would be natural for some people at that particular point in time for them to say, okay, I'm holding back because I have been there. I've done that. Done that. It didn't work. It's not going to change. It's going to keep going. It didn't work then. It didn't work now. I'm done. And then they hold back. And then throughout their Christian life, they wonder, why isn't God so powerful in me? Why can't I see more of what I would really love to see? It's quite often it's because we hold things back. And sometimes when you even get older, it's easier to hold back because, well, I'm not as healthy anymore. I can't do all that stuff. And so I hold back, whatever it is. You know what? Holding back from God never turns out really good. It just doesn't. Take it from a person who has held back numerous times. I know. And I bet you everyone here, there's been times in which your life you're saying, I hold back, it's too scary, I don't want to go there. Rather than jump in, take a risk. But you never move on for God if you never take a risk. Right, folks? Stand with me, would you please? I want you just for a moment to think about the area. Is there an area in your life in which you feel like you are holding back? It may be something that you've never ever said to anybody, even, even your spouse or a best friend, but you recognize that's where it's at. And I would say this would be a good time this morning for you to just to center in and to say, Lord, Help me to take a step forward rather than just staying where I'm at. And if that's where you are this morning, what I'd like for you to do, you should bow your heads, close your eyes, and, and you, you're, you're wanting to say to the Lord, but I also want you just to, if you would this morning, Acknowledge to me by just making eye contact with me. And then I'll, after I make contact with you, you can look back down. So if that's where you are, just make eye contact with me right now, would you please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Heavenly Father, we pause at this moment here and I just want to say thank you for the power of your word and for the stories in which we see people, even the same person, do failure like Peter and then he ends up winning and being successful and, and we want to be like that. We know that we're going to fail at times in our lives, but we also recognize that we all want to keep on getting up and walking with you because we recognize that with you, you make a difference in our lives. And for each one of those that uh, raise their eyes toward me, and maybe some of them just raised it to you because of their own personal situation, I ask, Lord, that this morning that you would honor them and that you would give them a boldness and a strength and a courage that goes very, very deep into their life that would help them to be closer to you. For those that have maybe been hurt and burned by people, I ask, Lord, that you would enable them to take another risk. And I know for some, that's a very difficult thing to do. But Lord, give him power and strength to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, dear saints, followers of Jesus, lovers of God, May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his strong, wonderful peace that passes us all understanding. And may your heart be triggered by his faith in you throughout this day and as you walk out of this building. In Christ's name, amen.